Imagine a distributed system where your application runs on multiple machines and nodes. For example, a banking system where multiple transactions might try to update the same account balance simultaneously. When multiple transactions or nodes try to modify the same data simultaneously, the final outcome can be unpredictable and depend on the timing and order of operations. This can result in data corruption, inconsistencies or incorrect calculations. This is known as race condition. For example, if one process has updated a value but another process is still working with the old value, it can lead to errors and unexpected behavior. In some cases, multiple processes can get stuck waiting for each other to release resources, resulting in a deadlock where none of the processes can proceed. So for shared resources such as a database, a file or a specific piece of data, you must ensure that only one node or process accesses and modifies this resource at a time. That's the problem distributed locking solves. In essence, a distributed lock is a mechanism that allows only one node or process in a distributed system to acquire a lock on a shared resource. This prevents race condition and ensures data integrity when multiple nodes try to access and modify the same resource concurrently. In my previous video, I explained some of the real world use cases of optimistic locking. Now, compared to distributed locking, think of optimistic locking as a polite conversation where people assume they won't be interrupted and only apologize if they accidentally talk over each other. Distributed locking on the other hand is like a formal meeting with a strict agenda and a designated speaker who controls the floor to prevent anyone from interrupting. Optimistic locking primarily operates at the application or database level, whereas distributed locking operates across multiple nodes or processes in a distributed system. Optimistic locking manages concurrent updates to the same data record or object within a single system or database. It relies on version numbers or timestamps to detect conflicts and resolve them when multiple transactions try to modify the same data concurrently. It also assumes that conflicts are rare and optimizes for performance by allowing concurrent access until a conflict is detected. For example, two users editing the same document in a collaborative editor, which we have seen previously. Distributed locking coordinates access to shared resources, for example, files, database, configuration data, across different machines or processes. It employs various algorithms, centralized, token-based, quorum-based, etc., which is to ensure that only one node or process can hold a lock on a resource at a time. It also assumes that the conflicts are possible or likely due to distributed nature of the system and prioritizes preventing conflicts over performance optimization. For example, multiple servers accessing and updating the same inventory count in a distributed e-commerce system. An ideal distributed log should guarantee that only one node can hold the log at a time, eliminating race conditions and ensuring that operations are performed atomically. It should guarantee that log should not become unavailable if a node fails. The acquiring and releasing log should be efficient and not introduce significant overhead. The nodes should have a fair chance of acquiring log without starvation. Now, like I said before, there are several algorithms and approaches for implementing distributed logs, each with its own trade-offs. For example, centralized locking has a single node or service that acts as a central log manager. All nodes here request and release logs through this node. It is simple to implement and easier to understand. But the central node is a single point of failure and its performance can become a bottleneck under high load. In token-based locking, a unique token is passed around among nodes. Only the node holding the token can access the shared resource. And so it can be more fault tolerant than centralized locking. However, it is a little bit more complex to implement and potential for issues with token loss or expiration are always a problem. Let's talk about quorum-based locking, which is usually implemented using Redis. Imagine a cluster of five Redis instances nodes A, B, C, D, and E. And we want to implement a distributed log using Redlog, which is a Redis algorithm, to ensure only one client can access a shared resource at a time, even in the face of node failures. And here are the algorithm steps. So let's say at the acquired time, the client records the current time as T1. During log acquisition phase, the client attempts to acquire the log on each Redis instance using set nx command, with a log key and a unique value say its client ID. 
Each Redis instance responds with OK if the lock is acquired successfully or Null if it is held by another client. The client includes the log validity time or TTL with each set NX command to ensure that logs don't become stale if the client crashes. The client calculates the time elapsed since step 1, for example, T2 minus T1. And then it does the quorum check, meaning if the client has acquired the log on a majority of instances, at least 3 out of 5 in our example, and the elapsed time is less than the log validity time, the log is considered acquired. Otherwise, the lock is not acquired. And if the lock was acquired, the client must release the lock on all Redis instances using DEL command. For example, let's say the client successfully acquires lock on instances A, B, and C within the validity time. The lock is considered acquired because it has a majority. If the client crashes before releasing the lock, the locks on A, B, and C will eventually expire due to the TTL, allowing another client to acquire the lock. The quorum requirement or the majority ensures fault tolerance. Even if one or two Redis instances fail, the log can still be acquired and released correctly as long as majority of instances are operational. This prevents a single point of failure and increases the system resilience. So basically it aims for high fault tolerance and availability. However, this approach is more complex and potential for issues with clock synchronization between nodes. And this has been a subject of debate. In leader election algorithm, nodes elect a leader and the leader is responsible for granting locks. It avoids single point of failure, but again, can be complex to implement and leader election can take time and resources. You can check out my video on leader election algorithm where I explain this algorithm in detail with practical examples, both pros and cons. Now, Redis is a popular choice for implementing distributed logs due to its speed, simplicity, and built-in commands like set and X, which atomically sets the key only if it doesn't exist, and expire, which sets a timeout for the log to prevent it from being held indefinitely. Let's check out a simple Java example that demonstrates distributed locking using Redis, leveraging set and X, expire, and DL commands. We'll use the JDIS library, a popular Java client for Redis. So here, we define a log key to represent the log and a log expiry seconds timeout to prevent indefinite logs. We establish a connection to the Redis server using JDIS and we acquire the log using JDIS.set. It attempts to set the log key to the value locked only if it doesn't exist, meaning NX. The EX option sets the expiration time in seconds. If the log is acquired successfully, it returns OK, otherwise it returns null. And if the log is acquired, the code enters the perform critical section method, which represents the protected section of the code that only one thread or process should execute at a time. In this example, the critical section simulates work by sleeping for 5 seconds. In the finally block, we check if the lock is still held by this thread by comparing the value of lock key to locked. And if so, we delete the key to release the lock. And then we also close the Redis connection. This example demonstrates a basic distributed lock with Redis. For more robust implementation, however, you may consider using Redis modules or libraries like Redison, which provide additional features like automatic lock renewal. Now, Zookeeper is also a distributed coordination service specifically designed for tasks like leader election, configuration management, and distributed locking. It offers strong consistency guarantees and robust features for handling node failures, making it a reliable choice for critical locking scenarios. It can be more complex to set up and manage computer Redis. HCD is a distributed key value store similar to Zookeeper and often used for distributed locking and configuration management. It also provides a simple API and is known for its reliability and fault tolerance. It's again a popular choice for cloud native applications and Kubernetes environments. Now, some relational databases such as PostgreSQL, MySQL, and NoSQL databases such as MongoDB do offer built-in locking mechanisms that can be used for distributed locking. This can be a convenient option if you are already using these databases for other purposes. However, database-based locking might not be as performant as specialized solutions like Redis or Zookeeper, especially under high load. So the best tool for distributed locking depends on your specific requirements. If low latency is critical, Redis might be a better choice. And if strong consistency guarantees are essential, Zookeeper or HCD might be more suitable. And if you need a simple solution, Redis built-in commands might suffice. And if you are already using a particular database, 
leveraging its built-in locking mechanisms might be more convenient. Ultimately, there is no one-size-fits-all answer. It's crucial to evaluate the trade-offs and choose the tool that best aligns with your application needs and your team expertise. Thank you.